evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Mitchell Ringos. Well, day two of the Community Safety and Wellbeing Forum saw members of the community come out to give their input on the city's most pressing issues. Jessica Clement reports. A couple dozen residents came out to the Prince Arthur Hotel on Saturday for day two of the forum. The group spoke about what issues they've had in the city and the steps that need to be taken to work towards solutions. Community member Mackenzie Mallon says she's heard a couple of issues while she's been at the event, but the one that stood out the most to her is transportation in the city. What my table was talking about, and I really think that it's a human right, uh, if we could have free transit for the community, um, especially for people who are living in poverty in our community, um, who are um, disadvantaged by systems in our community, if we could allow them to just get around the city, um, it it could change people's life. Samantha Zarobin, co-chair of the People with Lived Experience program, says she hopes the community takes the knowledge they've gained over the last two days and brings real change to the city. Um, I sat at several tables and discussed several issues that um, have arisen over the city and possible solutions of what we want to be seen. And I just hope that we can um, all work together to provide a safer and more healthier city for um, all generations of people. Community safety and well-being specialist Leanne Chevret says the next steps will be taking the information shared at the meetings and bringing them back to action tables that are supporting the efforts in the community. It's really important to include the voice of people living in our community. They really are the context experts. They live in the community, they experience the community, and so we really need to include their voices in these conversations and to bring those forward. Jessica Clement, TBT News. In other news, Iran's powerful Revolutionary Guard issued a harsh warning to protesters today as many fear the repressive regime will increase its brutal crackdown of dissent. And as CTV's Kevin Gallagher tells us, mass demonstration denouncing the regime for the last month are receiving signs of solidarity across Europe and Canada. The head of Iran's powerful Revolutionary Guard issued an ominous threat to anti-regime protesters. Today is the end of the riots, Commander-in-Chief Hossein Salami warns, don't go to the streets anymore. Huge demonstrations denouncing the country's strict theocratic rule have raged across Iran for the past six weeks. More than 200 protesters have been killed with reports of security forces opening fire into crowds. There are now concerns the violent suppression of this movement will only increase. Well, it sounds like a prelude to a bloody crackdown or to a massacre. Um, uh, the Iranian regime you know, is certainly capable of doing this. They've done this before. The unrest started after the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini last month, while she was in the custody of the morality police. The Kurdish woman allegedly failed to cover her hair. European demonstrators spoke out against Iran's strict religious laws, as many called for greater women's rights and an end to Iran's autocratic government. We don't want this regime anymore, and they need to help Iranian uh, people to actually uh, uh, pass from this regime and get to the democracy. People linked arms in solidarity with Iranian protesters in Canadian cities as well, with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau promising consequences for those leading the repressive regime. Those people responsible now will never be forgotten, will never be allowed into Canada. Iran's government is blaming foreign powers like Israel and the United States for creating the dissent as the country's Islamic clerics face the greatest challenge to their power in more than a decade. Kevin Gallagher, CTV News, Ottawa. MP Marcus Polowski is reacting to the news that the Federal Electoral Boundaries Commission has added a hearing date in Thunder Bay, allowing for public feedback to the proposed changes to the federal riding boundaries. Many in the community were calling for a hearing in this city, including Polowski. The hearing will take place November 8th at the Valhalla, and the deadline to register to speak to the committee is Friday. The proposed riding changes would reduce Northern Ontario's federal riding from 10 to 9 and would merge part of the Kenora riding with Thunder Bay-Rainy River.
Pulowski attended the Boundary Commission hearing in Sioux Lookout and was disappointed when there was no originally, originally no Thunder Bay date. He says the decision to add one will be important for local feedback. If, if, if they're trying to have public consultation to not have a hearing in Thunder Bay and make us drive, as I did, all the way up to Sioux Lookout, having these meetings and the fact that people want to participate and actually want to be there in the meetings is certainly indicative of, of the value of actually meeting in person. And so I'm glad they came here. Northern Ontario has lost two ride, hasn't lost two ridings since 1974 because of low population growth rate compared to other parts of the province. As a wrap-up to Waste Reduction Week activities, Eco Superior and the city hosted a community clothing swap at Lakehead University this week. The swap allowed participants to refresh their closets while also meeting neighbours, saving money and providing a second life to their unwanted clothes. The third week of October is Waste Reduction Week and community members were invited to take part in a number of activities and workshops aimed at reducing the amount of waste created in Thunder Bay. The clothing swap continued those efforts by encouraging people to reuse items and donate the things they didn't wear anymore. Eco Superior Program Director Ashley Prem says this helps divert unwanted textiles from the landfill, which has become a problem in recent years as 10.5 million tons of clothing and textiles gets uh, disposed of every year in North America. She wants to encourage residents to continue reducing their waste throughout the year, not just on Waste Reduction Week. So this one week, it's it, in part, it's a celebration of what we have achieved in the past, but it's also a reminder that there's always something more that we can be doing. Sometimes we learn about new ways that we can reduce waste. So, so it's to celebrate and to remind people and to encourage them to continue throughout the year. Well, exchanging and reusing clothes before they make it to a landfill is one of the most impactful actions that people can have on their own waste. Um, and it's great to see the amount of people that came out today. It's an innovative event. It's new for the community. To find out more about waste reduction or learn about other ways to help out the planet, you can visit EcoSuperior's website at ecosuperior.org. Food Banks Canada has released its annual hunger count report, and the numbers are grim. Nearly 1.5 million Canadians visited a food bank in March this year. The organization says that's a 35% increase from three years ago. CTV's Lydia Chuback has more. And this is our bridge. The people who run the Cochrane Food Bank are not surprised by the news that visits to food banks have reached a record high in Canada. They say people of all backgrounds are struggling. And this food bank is facing its own challenges as well. It acts as a hub for 15 food banks in the area, including those in Timmins, and it hasn't been able to receive important food items from distributors in Toronto. Uh, right now we're struggling. We're all struggling because we don't have any frozen, uh, frozen meat. At first it was uh, trucker issues in Toronto, and the amount of food given to Toronto or donated to Toronto that is causing problems right now. So we're just waiting for a resolution for that. Beaton says it's a load of pressure to bear because people are in need. Food Banks Canada reports half a million children visited food banks in the month of March alone, and there was a 14% increase by those who have jobs. It's the organization that collects the data on food bank visits every year in March, and its report is the only national study of food banks. It says food banks are working their hearts out, and Canadians are generous. But it says throwing more food at the issues is not going to solve the problem. Food insecurity is really the result of income insecurity. And so one of the big drivers is the cost of housing. And so municipalities have a huge role to play in making sure that there's affordable housing. So in addition to, and, and, and what that means is that they need to work with the provincial government and the federal government. Newton says the other two issues forcing people to turn to food banks are food costs and low social assistance rates and would like to see an income floor for those people and a living wage as opposed to a minimum wage. Lydia Chuback, CTV News, Timmins. Well, the colder weather means it's time to start saying goodbye to a number of summer pastimes and activities, including hitting the links as Thunder Bay's 2022 golf season is coming to a close. Most of the golf courses around the area are already closed for the season. However, Emerald Greens Golf Course, Northern Lights Golf Complex and Dragon Hills Golf Course are still open for those who want to go golfing one last time. 
Dragon Hills owner Michael Komar says it's been a successful season and they're glad to be able to stay open a little longer for the golfing diehards. He adds that they won't be closing the course until the first snowfall. We've been known to stay open until at least November. I guess 25th was the latest we've ever opened, but we're usually here till Remembrance Day anyways, unless the snow comes. While well, the greens are phenomenal here right now and the course has been great, the guys have been doing a great job and uh, uh, we're just happy to be open. A Thunder Bay man had the shopping spree of a lifetime yesterday after his friend won the Rock Raid contest put on by Darcy's No Frills Grocery Store in Rock 94. Brad Jarvis had the whole store to himself early yesterday morning as he raced around the aisles searching for free grocery items carrying uh, a Rock 94 sticker. Jarvis's friend had won the radio contest but was out of town so he agreed to sub in. The objective was to find up to $500 worth of these specially marked item and put them in the grocery cart and he had 9 minutes and 43 seconds to pull it off. Jarvis says it wasn't easy but he had a great time. Uh, it was very tough, uh, definitely out of breath after all that, uh, definitely a way to wake up in the morning for sure. <laughs> so how did you make up, what, what's the total? Uh, we went out to 225. Okay, so there's about 500. Uh, we left about half of it out there, so. Okay, so what is this experience like for you? Uh, it was good, it was awesome, it was a lot of fun. Um, like I said, my friend Seamus got me to do it for him because he's in Grand Marais right now, so it was definitely a lot of fun. You can check out Jarvis's entire Rock Raid adventure on the Rock 94 Facebook page. We're now joined by sports anchor Kurt Black. I just want to say, Ted on the screen, it was nice to see him. Honestly, I think Ted might have played a role, though, in yeah. uh, him only getting half of the money. Because oh, from sharing a newsroom with Mr. Ted Jessup, yeah. he's very entertaining. He can be a little distracting, so uh, that might have played a role. But yeah, uh, yeah great to see Ted there. Uh, and it was a busy week on the football field yes, for high yes. school football here in the Bay. It wrapped up last night with the senior semifinals. We'll have those highlights right after the break.